Good morning and welcome, everyone. This, this morning when I left Henry out, I felt like I was opening a refrigerator from the last couple days. What a wonderful wake up. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our loving God. Let us pray. Father God, we come here this morning to worship and glorify your holy name. You have blessed us abundantly, Lord. You died for our sins. You forgave and redeemed us, and you have granted us eternal life. Help us, Lord, always remember that without you, our life would be meaningless. Help us remember our purpose in everything we do is to glorify you. Lord, let our life reflect you. Fill us with compassion, love, and forgiveness, forgiveness, blessing others as, as you have blessed us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first hymn this morning is found on page 702 in your hymnals, Sing with all the saints of glory. Life eternal, heaven rejoices, 
Jesus lives who once was dead. Join we now the deathless voices, child of God, lift high your head. Patriots from the distant ages, saints all longing for their hell. Prophets, psalmists, seers, and sages, all await the glory give. Life eternal, oh, what wonders, proud on faith, what joy unknown. Stand amidst the closing thunder, saints will come may be seated. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray today for all those whose dreams have not been realized. You know them. They are the discouraged, the tired, the poor, the conflicted. They've been wounded on their journey of life. They may struggle with health, economic, family conflicts, depression, worry, or other mental and physical issues. They may have been wounded from criticism and discouraged by what they have come to believe. They may be lonely, tired, and frequently despairing. They worry about parents, children, or grandchildren, and know they are helpless in many situations. They may have outlived their friends and contemporaries and long to go home with you, Lord. You who know us in the darkness of our hearts, illuminate that darkness so that all of us can see your will and experience it triumphantly, no matter our condition. Lord, we give you thanks now in the quiet of our hearts for caregivers who work tirelessly to assist those who cannot live alone. We thank you for your presence with those who reach out in war-torn areas to bring comfort and hope to a ravaged population. We thank you for those who live out their faith by reaching out to the chronologically challenged, those who struggle with safe and secure life living, uh, living arrangements those who are cut off from society, mentally or physically, and those who could never catch the breaks. Thank you for placing people who faithfully care and serve you and care and help others as a result of their faith. Lord, we lift these concerns and thanksgivings to you with our gratitude and our commitment to you to hear your word for us individually and as a congregation and your church as we pray, as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join me in reciting the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Over the last several months, uh, we've uh, been committed to part of our mission to relieve human suffering. And we do that in a lot of ways by providing shoes and, and uh, by contributing to services that provide meals as we do uh, uh, not quite once a month uh, at Mission First in Pottstown. And one of the things that has really captivated you, for which I've thanked you a number of times, is the, the generosity that you showed uh, to the war torn in Ukraine. And Jeanette is here this morning to, uh, for a couple of words for us here, but she will stay with us through the coffee tower, flower, uh, fellowship time, uh, and uh, Cher will move the microphone over so we can all hear her uh, and, ha and hear you ask questions and whatever, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, take that, uh, we'll take that time. Jeanette, welcome. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you, everyone, everyone who did this effort to help Ukraine. Thank you for your prayers for Ukrainian people who f fight for Ukraine, the soldiers who are wounded, and uh, your contribution was very, very important. I came to say a good news that all of the packages were delivered. It was delivered safe, and uh, um, people who g got this help, it was uh, um, medical supplies, it was food, it was um, the, the other equipment that helped uh, uh, with the fight. Uh, I want to just say thank you very much. I am very happy that they got it and they asked me, please come back to these people and say thank you. It was very, very helpful and this is true. Uh, more information about who got this um, uh, uh, help, I will tell you later. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Janetta. They, they call that a teaser. <laughs> Stay tuned, right? I want to say thank you for your generosity as well. As I calculate it, I know what we received in cash. As I've calculated, you and neighbors, folks who drive by and stop by the church and drop things off, Sometimes things we haven't asked for, but they still participate in, in what they're doing and what we're doing. Uh, my calculations are we probably have uh, contributed or have available uh, in excess of about $14,000. So I want to say thank you again uh, that we've put all the value in those, in those things because it makes a difference. You make a difference with what you do, with what you say, and with what you give. Thank you. Let's receive the morning offering. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. 
With grateful heart, O Lord, hearts, O Lord, we come and present these gifts, these offerings, these sacrifices to you. May you consecrate them. May they provide hope, sustenance, and help to others. Use them, Lord. But more than that, use us for the building of your kingdom on earth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning's responsive reading is from the books of Exodus and Matthew. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord this morning's responsive reading is from the books of Exodus and Matthew. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. The scripture this morning is really pretty straightforward. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery, steal, lie, or cover your neighbor's belongings. By the way, I know it reads, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's husband either is implied in that. All right. We're focusing on the six commandments that inform how we behave toward other people. We're doing it in summary form and we're doing it through Jesus words. As we know, these instructions provide the basis for the other 600 plus laws developed to interpret and implement those basic ones in the 10 commandments. The gospel lesson our instruction from Jesus is a little briefer. Well, a lot briefer. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It seems pretty simple, doesn't it? So simple that I can pronounce the benediction and close the service. And you all can get over to the food. That's what you really came for anyhow, isn't it? The fellowship. But wait, 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 wait. History and the news tell us it's not that easy. So put aside the thought of getting to the food early and allow your brain some refreshment. Because we have a tough time living with these commandments, either in the Old Testament or from Jesus. All we have to do is read the headlines or listen to the news we, to know we have a problem with this. Here are some of the headlines I, I, I dug up on Friday. 
Employees at Amazon warehouse allege racially hostile work environment. 94 migrants escaped suffocation in truck in Mexico. Think about the ones who didn't make it out of trucks in Mexico or in the United States because they were smuggled in and their smugglers only cared about the money. Court okays death penalty in 1980 sex slave murders. Man who sold bleach as COVID cure extradited. Priest wounded in shooting in southern Mexico. Israeli fire kills teen in the West Bank. No obvious reasons why teen killed three siblings. Dozens of Ukrainian POWs feared dead as Kyiv and Moscow blame each other for the strike. Cable company ordered to pay over $7 billion in damages to a family of Texas grandmother murdered by an employee. Turns out the cable guy visited the home the next day off duty, the home of Betty Thomas, age 83, for a service call. One day, the next day he went back in 2019, robbed and killed her. Now, now these are just a few of the headlines. There's still mass murders at schools, malls and churches. There are stories of people abusing cashiers, flight attendants, wait staff, and harassing others with slander, demeaning, uh, name calling, generalizations, and other self-centered behaviors which rob others of dignity. And I'm confident that all of us would agree, well, maybe most of us, that they are wrong and we wouldn't do that. And those who do such things need to have their come to Jesus moment. And some of the people doing these things tragically self-identify as Jesus followers. But if we do an honest inventory of our thoughts, our temptations, and our attitudes, I doubt that any of us could honestly say we're not in that group that needs self-examination. And I must admit that my thoughts and desires are not always pure. And my faith constantly challenges the temptations to dismiss people who hurt, frustrate, or sometimes disagree with me. I'm reminded of that 1960 sign, if you were on trial for being Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I also believe that if many who say they are Christians were on trial, many would be acquitted for lack of evidence. The Oxford Holy Club, started by Charles Wesley, moderated by his brother John and convert George Whitfield in the 1740s, knew the nature of temptation. So they produced what we shared with you a couple of weeks ago, 22 questions for us, their members, and now for us, to use privately in our devotions, to reflect on who we are. As I use the list, there's always something that causes me to pause and recognize that, yes, I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's the question. Have you been working on those questions? Let me ask a few of those questions for those who have not taken advantage of the discipline. As I read some of them, please just take a moment to reflect on them. Then ask yourself, if you've answered in the affirmative, what will you do about it? You see, part of this commandment of Jesus is that if we don't start with our own spiritual health, what we give others will be lacking. So, okay, here we go. Am I honest in all my acts and words? And, or do I exaggerate? Let's just pause there a minute. We were probably okay with, am I honest? When it comes to exaggeration, yeah, maybe not. Sometimes I'll ask it as, do I overstate things? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work habits, or habits? 
most of us don't have to worry with most of it, with about the work habits. Sometimes we still worry like we work. Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? I couldn't help myself. He made me do it. We remember that from Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Well, in this case, probably Don made me do it. I don't know. Am I enjoying prayer? Now, that's an interesting question because I never thought about prayer before I went through this examination about so, as something I should enjoy. But it is our presence with God. It's our time, our private time. Are we enjoying our prayer? When did I last speak to someone about my faith? Here's one I'll bet most of us have to deal with. Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I disobey God in anything? Is there anyone who I fear, dislike, disown, criticize? hold a resentment toward or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? Now, if you're working through these daily, you know that you don't get through those whole 22. I mean, it would probably take you the whole day and by then it'd be time to start over again. But it's important to work through them. We only talked about, we only didn't talk about them. We only lifted up eight here this morning of the 22. Now, I think for enough of us this morning, I think that's enough. I recommend you work through that list, probably not all of them daily, but a couple a day. We all have places where we can improve ourselves and, and improve our witness to Christ. So we need to work on ourselves before we can work on anyone else. And even that statement has problems. Jesus is clear that judging others is not to be a part of our attitudes or our behaviors. It says that in Matthew 7, 1 in the Sermon on the Mount. Luke has some other advice for us in, in chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. He says, judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For the measure you use will be the measure back to you. That's according to East, uh, the English Standard Version. Now I want to say just a little bit about these texts. Because I've taken them out of context on occasion, particularly in fundraising. But it's really not when it says give and you'll be given to you. This is not a contractual arrangement. What he's saying is that generosity begets generosity. And that doesn't matter whether it's in the way we behave towards somebody or what we're putting in the collection plate. The question really is, are we doing what Christ desires? And remember, we prayed earlier, forgive us our trespasses. Notice the plural. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna start a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And that's probably gonna be, I'm sorry, not in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Lord's Prayer. And it'll probably be our study for the fall as well. Uh, but think about, forgive us our trespasses. Now, I happen to prefer sins, and, and some of you may notice that when I pray the Lord's Prayer, I frequently get stuck and get it confused because I've been sinners, I've been a trespasser, and I've been a debtor. And when I get to that point coming up, and I know it when I'm praying with somebody, particularly with shut-ins, it's just flat out embarrassing. I'm going to have to take a card along with me with the Lord's Prayer on it. Because when I get to that, I get befuddled and then I stumble all over it and then the prayer just goes south. Well, sins, I prefer sins. Forgive us our sins as we forgive, as we forgive, as we forgive those who sin against us. Perhaps the most important statement that I've ever heard made around this was two people 
were struggling, one of them feeling guilty about something they had done, and they approached the other, and the other said, I distinctly remember forgetting about that. That's what it takes. That's what forgiveness is and giving it, forgetting about it. Now, sometimes it still haunts us, and we have to work through it. You know, to forgive somebody doesn't mean that it goes back to a clean slate. It means we've got to work going forward, and we take those things into consideration. But we don't hold it against them. We don't, we don't beat them up for it or continue beating, up, beating them up for it. So Jesus instructs his followers to get their own lives in order and be representatives of him. Now, all of us want to be forgiven. None of us want to carry guilt around. That's why near-death people often are haunted by their behavior, which they cannot fix. I've had some on their deathbeds who said to me, I've been a terrible person. And I'll talk about their salvation, and they've accepted Christ, they've accepted forgiveness, but they never really made it right with the people who they've insulted, who they've abused. And here they are, and there's no way to fix that. After death, there can be no reconciliation with our family or neighbors, though I might have my salvation. I take with me that guilt, but at death, it's gone. But until death, it can torment us tremendously before the reaper comes. So I ask myself and I ask others, and it is a behavior changing question. Do I need to make a relationship right with someone? In reality, asking that question is not enough. What we will, what we will do to make, what will we do to make that become a reality? Waiting until we know we're headed for our eternal reward isn't a time on which we can depend. Sometimes it comes suddenly, unexpectedly. In February, my cousin at age 64, almost 65, running his own business, looking forward to his first grandchild, and that grandchild was due imminently, dropped over dead while descending a basement stairs on his job. He didn't have time to consider his end of life concerns. For him and his family, the end of life was immediate, was blunt, and it was shocking. Paul in Colossians 3 verses 5 through 11 gives us more detailed instructions for living out the life of loving others as we love ourselves. Here's what he says. So put to death the parts of your life that belong to the earth, such as sexual immorality, moral corruption, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is identified sometimes as idolatry. He says, the wrath of God is coming upon disobedient people because of these things. You used to live this way when you were alive to those things. But now set aside these things, things such as anger. We were probably okay, most of us in this room, with the questions, the, er the earlier events, you know, the sexual immorality and all that stuff. But now we get down to the nitty gritty. Anger, put aside rage, malice, slander, and obscene language. Don't lie to each other. Take off the old human nature with its practices, Paul says, and put on the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge by conforming to the image of the one who created it. In the image, in this image, it's him in, it's in, him, in his image, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all things and in all people. The apostle Paul continues to elaborate on these things in various epistles. In 1 Corinthians 13, for instance, he details what, it, what he understands how members of a church, of a congregation, ought to live out their lives. He talks about love. We use that chapter, it's favorite chapter 
for marriage, which it has nothing to do with. It has to do with our everyday life, how we treat each other, how we treat ourselves. He understands it to be how the members of the church live out their lives. And it's not easy. It's not easy to be in relationship because we're called to put God as we know him through Jesus first in our lives. That's Matthew 6, And live a transformed life that differentiates us from others by our service to him. Now, as we move toward revitalizing our congregation, not for our purposes, let me say that again. I often hear churches being concerned about their, their lagging attendance and lagging membership and disappearing membership, concerned about how we preserve our relationships. And while, we, while those are important, the church's business is evangelism. We'll talk about the Great Commission next week. But Jesus says in it, go into all the world and make disciples. And Jesus also says, I will build my church. Our job is not to preserve the past. Our job is to relate the people today where they are and bring them into the kingdom. That's our business. Introducing others to Jesus for their full transformation. Not simply camp followers. We don't want camp followers. We want folks who become disciples, become apprentices, as we talked about in the past, of Jesus. And those disciples, those apprentices, trying to come, become as Christ-like as they can, are also called to introduce others to Christ. Now, frankly, we have to deal with our desires and put them aside for what God desires. That means understanding who Jesus is, what Jesus requires, and inviting others to know him. And we need to do it caringly, not forcefully. Nothing puts many folks, including me, off Christian or non-Christian, puts them off more than confront confrontational evangelism. Walking down the boardwalk and somebody comes out of nowhere and asks me if I'm saved, just makes me defensive. I want to run. And while I suppose some people come to know Jesus that way, I don't believe it's a biblical approach. Now, I like to watch Chicago Fire. Anybody with me watch Chicago Fire? Nobody, Mike does. Nobody watches Chicago Fire. Wow. Mike, I guess we're the elite. <laughs> That's right, be careful. The, the, the drama's good, and, but one of the things that's consistent in the show is there's a, an episode every couple of days that you see them using a tool called a slamigan that's used when somebody's caught behind in a fire and they can't get in and so they'll have this door it's a it's a wedge on a handle with a with a sledgehammer attached to it and you whack the sledgehammer and it pushes it in and they pull it out and it opens the door it was invented by one of the members of their fire crew well the reality is that they use a slamigan to break doors down. But Christians are not firefighters with slamigans. Christians don't save others into the kingdom of God. Jesus takes them into the kingdom of God. Our responsibility is to live lives that reflect the values taught and lived by Jesus so that we are encouraging, we're inviting in our very nature the others to meet him. We can't invite someone into a saving relationship with Jesus if we belittle them in any way. They won't listen to us 
if we don't listen to and understand them or show them understanding, accept them where they are and love them with all their flaws, just as we've been loved with all of our flaws, even if they belong to the other side. When political views play to deep-seated fear, we won't change minds. We can't. And while we can share with them, being pushy, loud, or dismissive only makes the gulf between us grow wider. Jesus' approach is much more effective. It's summarized in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Even Jesus inv- in- waits to be invited in. John 14, 23 reminds us, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home in him. Loving God this way and loving humankind requires that our love of God be sincere and radical. If we love God, we will sell out to him and naturally serve him by loving and serving others. But too often, we stop and never reach the most important of that second commandment. Jesus said we are to love others, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now, there is such a thing as correct, uh, uh, as corrupt self-love. And it has its root in the great sins we commit. That kind of self-love has, really has to die in us, putting ourselves before others. The commandment is to put ourselves on equal status. We are to love others as we love ourselves. And we must love our neighbors as honestly and sincerely as we love ourselves. But unfortunately, that kind of love often asks us to deny ourselves for the good of others. The reality that the people could care less about how much we know until they know how much we care. Let me say that again. The reality is that people could care less about how much we know. We can know the Bible, have it memorized from front to back, quote every verse, but they don't really care until they know how much we care. Therefore, our choice to obey these two commandments will mold our hearts and our lives into something beautiful that honors and pleases God. Now, as we approach the future of this congregation, the future depends on whether we put our own needs and wants ahead of serving God and modifying our thinking and doing to match what is necessary to reach others we are called to love. Are we willing to focus on how we reach others and put our needs and wants aside? The other day, Fran and I were shopping for something in a Walmart, and I decided while I was there to look for shoes. So I walked up to the shoe department as I walked down one of the men's aisle. There was a guy looking there, probably a Mennonite, from the way he was dressed, standing in the middle of the aisle, and as I excused myself to go behind him, he moved forward toward the rack to, to make pass way for me to pass easier in the back of him. And as I passed, he turned to me and said, yeah. He had a pair of sandals in his hand. He said, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether these are a need or a want. Boy, I hadn't heard that in a long time. Are they a need or a want? And I stopped and said, wow, I don't know when I purchased the last, when the, was the last time that I purchased anything I needed. Purchased a lot of stuff I want. And that's what happens to us in church. We get comfortable with the things we want, not the things we need. And friends, that question of, is this a want or a need, is precisely where we need to be for the future of our Christian family known as Mount Carmel. Groups are productive, not only because the group members do their specific jobs, but they keep their eye on the goal. The goal for any congregation is to be faithful disciples 
which may include giving up our wants for the needs of others and assisting them in their spiritual journey to find Christ. Over the next several months, what we do will matter more than it has for some time. And because all of our actions have consequences, we must be very serious and intentional about where we take this congregation. That's why we pray for the lead team every week on the first day of our prayer cycle. You wonder why it's there every week? Because the Lord has called us to do significant work. And we need to be led. We need your support. And there are prayer teams now in our lead team who are praying for just this work that God would make the, would give us a revelation of what we need to do to be faithful servants. We as a team need to be sensitive to God's word and will for us. But where we go will ultimately depend on whether or not you are willing to get aboard this train or to stay at the station. That's the bottom line. As a lead team, we continually invite you to help us get on board the train and get the train on the right track and then move out of the station in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes your word is hard to hear. Sometimes we don't want to hear it. We'd rather be comforted than challenged. And we know that we're comfortable. We're comfortable with who we've been and who we are. And we're looking forward to being even more comfortable. And as we do that, you call us into the world to love those and to bring them into the fold, to, make, to introduce them to you and help make them disciples. Lord, that's tough. It's difficult. And we come to you in despair and in hope, sometimes with anger and joy, because as change happens, we can't adapt the way we used to, nor do we want to frequently. So move in our hearts and our lives, Lord, that we can live these commandments that we've called us to do, to love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and to be faithful to you, that your church might be faithful to you, reaching others who are different than we are, but who need your grace and your hope just as much as we do. Hear us, O oh God. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. But Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the, Lord, as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and be not afraid. Believe in me. Now take the peace of Christ with you. Claim it as your own and share it with others, knowing that Christ is always by your side. You can depend on it. The grace and love of God bless, preserve, and keep you ever in his care. Amen. Stand to sing.
touched me and while smiling has spoken my name now my boat slept on the shoreline behind me by your side I will seek others in my name. Spoke in my